As I mentioned uh, briefly, we have an extraordinary group of people working in our emergency department. Every day and night they see some of the region's most acutely ill patients and many of them are in need of life-saving care. From 2016, for the 2016-17 year, there were over 60,000 patient visits to Kingston Health Sciences Center's emergency department. And I think there were, on top of that, visits to the urgent care center of about 50,000 more. <clears throat> Uh, the number continues to rise and they estimate currently that the number of people they will see will increase by over 20% in the next decade. I know we can all think of a situation when we needed the emergency department and it's not a scenario that we're keen on when we're facing it. Um, we invariably come through with a great sense of gratitude because the teams who work in the department manage the stress and the volume and the busyness of the place with great compassion and caring and incredible expertise. Um, but even with these increased demands, our emergency department at KHSC has recently been commended as having the greatest improvement in wait times for any emergency department in Ontario. We climbed up the list nine or ten places, I think. Oh, <laughs> apparently Dr. Messenger is going to tell you all about that. Pretend you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> And so he's going to tell you how they've done that. Um, and so I will uh, uh, invite Dr. Messenger to come forward and tell you a little bit about his background and his great passion for making sure we have excellent, excellent emergency care here in the Kingston region. Dr. Messenger. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for the opportunity to come and speak to you uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's a real privilege uh, for me. Um, uh, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, if you can't, I'll speak louder or uh, figure out how to turn up the microphone. But um, I don't want to uh, take up too much of your time, um, but uh, I do want to start by uh, saying thank you uh, first and foremost, um, because our department uh, has benefited uh, over many years from a great deal of support from this community, uh, as has our hospital uh, uh, generally, and, and from all of you in particular uh, in this room as supporters, uh, we uh, would just like to say thank you uh, for your engagement and your enthusiasm and your uh, contributions to helping uh, improve health care in our city. Um, to tell you a little bit about me, uh, I uh, did not grow up in Kingston, uh, but have lived here since I was 17. Um, and this room brings back memories because I had my wedding reception here, and I think that was the last time I spoke at this podium, actually. Uh, so I'll try to be less tearful today, perhaps. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I've lived uh, in the community for a long time. I did my undergraduate degree, and then uh, my medical degree, uh, and then my residency, and then my fellowship, all here in Kingston. Um, uh, I uh, betrayed us uh, briefly uh, in the last couple of years by doing a master's in the business school at McGill, uh, but I uh, try not to highlight that when I uh, print my CV and, and I am a, a Queen's grad. And I see actually in the audience, actually, it's interesting to come to a, a, a gathering like this because I see former colleagues and uh, former professors of mine in the audience, uh, none of whom will probably remember me, which is probably for the best. <laughs> um, but I want to speak to you uh, most importantly about uh, the emergency department um, and the service we provide and some of the challenges we face um, and, and to tell you why I'm excited um, for the future of emergency care in Kingston um, and uh, hopefully make you excited uh, about the future of emergency department care in Kingston. And I'll start by saying that uh, we are uh, a very uh, integrated department uh, when it comes to physicians in particular between Hotel Du and uh, the KGH sites. Um, and so the urgent care center at Hotel Du uh, is uh, uh, equally important to us as the emergency department at Kingston General Hospital site. Um, they both actually service uh, well in excess of uh, 55,000 patients per year. Um, and uh, what you may not know is that exactly the same group of physicians with exactly the same training work in both uh, of these sites. So we really are 
uh, one integrated um, set of emergency departments in the city that serve different patient groups, uh, but it's the same uh, team participating in that care. I'm going to speak to you particularly today about our KGH uh, site uh, and some of the challenges that we face there and um, uh, some of the work we're doing there. Um, and we are in the emergency do department really the go-to place uh, for the care of a wide range of medical issues um, that affect patients from all ages, from all walks of life, um, not only within our own city but also within our region. And so we see and look after multiply injured trauma patients. There were a couple of high profile cases of that just in the last week. Um, we are the go-to site when there is a mass gathering uh, in the city and uh, many of you will be familiar with some of the mass gatherings we uh, deal with. Um, we see a large number of patients suffering from from mental health crises, from addictions and their complications. We see people at all ages, from newborns uh, to the very old at the end of life. We deal uh, and have specialized programs in cardiac care and acute stroke um, that make us uh, uh, some of the, uh, one of the nation's leading sites for the care uh, of this type of illness. And so we are a catch-all. We uh, take whatever comes through our door and do our best to look after it with the help of our uh, colleagues and the other members of our team. And we do that not only for the city of Kingston, but we are a major referral hub for patients drawn from across the other 11 hospitals in our Lynn. Um, and uh, beyond, you know, as far away as Moose Factory. Uh, we receive patients uh, who come through the doors of our emergency department um, for specialized treatment or investigations that can't be accessed through their own communities. And so, although our city is not huge, our catchment area is well in excess of half a million people are served uh, through the services offered in the emergency department and in our center. And because of that, we're a busy place. The KHSC, uh, KGH site alone uh, sees uh, as many as 195 patients per day. Um, and concerningly, um, uh, and perhaps this reflects a number of things, population factors, population growth, but also changes and difficulties accessing care in other environments sometimes, our patient numbers are growing uh, at a really dramatic rate. So since 2009, we've had a 41% increase in our annual uh, visits at the KGH site uh, to the emergency department. And the graph down below in blue, if you can see that, the top line is our growth rate relative to growth in the rest of the province's hospitals on average. And you can see that our growth is outpacing the rest of the province at a really alarming rate. And there's no end in sight, it would seem. Interestingly, uh, this is just one patient subpopulation, uh, but this is a look at, in red, how, at the bottom, how uh, our general patient visit numbers are growing. The blue line is the number of visits related to mental health concerns and the rate of increase in those uh, patient visits uh, over the last few years. And you can see that uh, the increased uh, needs of that patient population and the growth in that patient population is fueling a lot of demand for services in acute mental health. Uh, and we are often the go-to site for access to those services. Um, we have an amazing team of people. Um, and I uh, can't speak highly enough about our nursing staff um, who provide frontline emergency care. There are over 110 nurses who work uh, in the KGH emergency department um, and they're supported by another 20 to 30 uh, uh, healthcare staff, uh, be it patient care assistants or uh, unit clerks who are full-time based in the emergency department. And our nurses are an incredibly uh, kind, experienced uh, professional group uh, who work sometimes in very uh, alarming conditions um, and are looking after what seems like at times to them an endless 
wave of people coming through the door who they're being asked to care for and look after. And I, every time I go to work, am overwhelmed uh, by how much they are able to do for so many people uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I can't speak highly enough uh, about how lucky we are um, uh, in our department to have a very experienced group of nurses and a very professional and kind group of nurses uh, who I'm proud to work with. In terms of physicians, um, uh, the benefit of having a medical school uh, in Kingston means that our community is served by a group of over 40 uh, specialist trained emergency physicians who've completed residencies lasting between three to five years, specifically uh, trained in providing emergency care. Um, and uh, our group is uh, recognized nationally and internationally uh, for not only the clinical work we do in emergency medicine, uh, but our group also uh, our leaders in education and research um, on emergency care issues um, and respected uh, very much so in Canada. I just returned from our national emergency medicine conference um, where uh, we were able to again demonstrate that the work being done in our department uh, and in this community uh, is really exceptional and, and leading the way in the country. Um, and so um, the physicians who work in emergency medicine uh, are, are excellent clinicians. We have subspecialists in toxicology, subspecialists in trauma and emergency uh, medical services, in intensive care, uh, in uh, global health research and outreach. Uh, and so really it's a, it's a very, very talented group of people. But uh, as department head, uh, part of my job is uh, recruiting and hiring people and most important to me is making sure that we hire people whose clinical care uh, is uh, incomparable uh, and there is not a single member of my department who I would not want looking after uh, my family uh, and uh, I am grateful uh, for my colleagues every day. Um, we're home to the second oldest emergency medicine residency training program in Canada. Many of you will know uh, my mentor and colleague, Dr. Jean Dagnoni, uh, who's been a fixture in this community for many years and retired uh, relatively recently. Jean created the specialty of emergency medicine in Canada, effectively. Um, he was uh, honored, actually, at our national meeting a couple of days ago with uh, an honorary life membership to the Canadian uh, Association of Emergency Physicians, which he was instrumental in founding uh, 40 years ago this year. Uh, and uh, our residency training program at any moment in time has 30 resident physicians uh, who are training to specialize uh, in emergency medicine in training programs that last from three to five years um, and so they are uh, as well intimately involved in the care of patients in our center and contribute a lot uh, to making sure that the physicians and other staff who work here are kept up to date, um, are kept on our toes, aren't allowed to become complacent, but rather are always pursuing uh, the most recent knowledge and advances in treatment, which in turn reflects in the kind of care we're able to provide. So that's who we are as people. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our space. Um, this is the most valuable piece of real estate in an emergency department, uh, the stretcher. Um, and our department currently has 40 bed spaces, um, which is a number that hasn't really changed dramatically uh, or uh, in any meaningful way in the 12 years I've been on staff uh, at the hospital. And really, the last meaningful update to our emergency department's physical plant was over 20 years ago. And as I've mentioned, the demand for access to care uh, in that space has gone up and up and up over the years. 40 beds may actually seem like it's a reasonable number to treat 200 patients a day. And if it were 40 beds, that would be a fair assumption. Um, but uh, on a daily basis, we remain actually quite challenged in getting patients into these beds to get the care that they need. And part of the reason for that is that at any moment in time, six of those beds may be occupied by patients who have been seen 
uh, and had treatment initiated by an emergency physician, but are waiting for specialist care, either uh, to be done as an inpatient in hospital or they need the opinion of a surgeon uh, or a cardiologist before they can be discharged. Uh, and so uh, they wait. Um, in, in these spaces uh, until a decision uh, on their ultimate discharge plan is made. Another, on average, 14 of these beds may be occupied by patients who have been through that process and are still waiting because they've been admitted to the hospital. Um, but there are no beds upstairs uh, on the wards uh, for them to go to. And any of you who've been admitted through the emergency department or are family members who've been admitted through the emergency department may recognize that your wait for a bed upstairs sometimes is longer than 24 hours. Um, and that time is spent in the emergency department. Um, and you receive the care you need, um, but what that does is occupy space that prevents us from being able to bring the next patient into that bed. And so, although we have a 40 bed emergency department, it effectively leaves us um, half of that space uh, in which to try to find the next uh, sick patient who needs care and to deliver to them in a timely way. And this is why you wait when you come to the emergency department. Um, in addition, these 20 beds aren't turned over quickly because we see a very complex, high needs patient population in Kingston. Um, often problems need several hours uh, to be assessed uh, and treated, even in patients who ultimately go home from the emergency department and aren't kept in hospital. And so again, that occupies space that uh, provides a block to access for other patients waiting to be assessed. And it's left to our nurse in the triage area when you come in to try to identify who has the most serious illness that needs the most rapid assessment. Um, and that's a very challenging job. On any given day, um, in January particularly, this might be what you see when you come by ambulance to the emergency department, is a crowded hallway with multiple patients on stretchers waiting for a space to be unloaded into to receive their care. Um, and so this is why there are waits in emergency departments. Um, uh, they're busy places, there's limited amounts uh, of real estate. Um, there's a misconception that it is people with minor problems, um, you know, sore fingers or, or feet or minor bumps or bruises who could be cared for elsewhere that are clogging up the system and preventing you from getting in to see a doctor in the emergency department. And that, in fact, is not true because those patients can be seen, assessed, and sent home very quickly and don't occupy that precious real estate for a long time. Rather, it's the fact that uh, the hospital system in general is so overwhelmed by the number of people it has to look after that providing care spaces for all of those people becomes difficult. Trying to fit people in anywhere we can sometimes. Um, and any available space in our department um, has and uh, is turned into a care space. Um, Hallway medicine has become a really unfortunate reality uh, in emergency departments um, uh, in Canada and elsewhere over many years. And we don't like doing this. Uh, it causes us as caregivers distress to move patients into hallways and to care for them in between storage units and equipment. Um, but the reason we do this is to make sure that the next person who comes gets just as good and timely care as the first person who comes. Um, and that is where the challenge of our physical space often lies. We're doing a lot to try to get more and more people through the emergency department in as timely a way as possible to make sure that people aren't waiting in a waiting room or on an ambulance stretcher to be assessed and get care. Uh, we'd much rather your wait happen after you've seen a doctor uh, than before. And so some of the solutions that 
we have implemented in the last few years have been to actually take a couple of our stretcher areas and take the stretchers away and replace them with chairs and have multiple chairs uh, in an area that might previously have been occupied just by one stretcher. And that allows us to see people in a private area, assess them, and then while they're waiting for a test or receiving an intravenous medication, if they are able to walk, if they can sit comfortably, they can move to an armchair and receive their treatment or wait for their test results, freeing up a space for other people to receive care. So if you're in the emergency department and you're asked to move to a chair, it's again to try to keep flow moving through that department. We actually have carved off about 50% of the square footage of our waiting room in the last couple of years and built a whole new uh, three bed fast track unit that's open in the evenings. Um, that allows us to see the people with the cuts, the scrapes, the sprained ankles, um, the minor illnesses um, in a rapid way with a dedicated physician and nurse in that area um, so that people are not having to wait five, six, seven hours for care for less urgent problems, which is a particular problem. We've also been involved in a lot of initiatives in collaboration with specialists outside of the emergency department looking at how flow through the entire hospital can be improved and how we can better um, uh, serve the patients who are admitted, get them home or elsewhere faster, and if you come to uh, other of these luncheons and other foundation events, I'm sure you'll hear speakers and colleagues from other departments who can explain some of those initiatives as well. But this combination of things as well as just sheer determination on the part of all the staff uh, who I work with has led to actually really uh, impressive results. Um, for the last, uh, I think it's now nine quarters, um, uh, we have been the most improved teaching hospital in the province of Ontario in terms of how long patients are waiting in beds in our emergency department. And we're also in the top 10 hospitals in Ontario, of all 76 hospitals in Ontario, uh, we're in the top 10 for having the shortest wait times to see a physician in the emergency department. And so that's an accomplishment of which I'm very proud um, and I think uh, uh, all the team I work with are very, very proud. That's taken a lot of work, uh, a lot of collaboration, sometimes some conflict, um, but uh, what that ultimately means is we are able to see sick patients in our department um, in a timely way um, to make sure they're getting the care they need. I recognize and I'm well aware that that may not be the experience that the person in the stretcher sometimes has. Uh, they may not feel the effect of these improvements um, because it may mean they're having to spend time in hallways. It may mean uh, they're uh, having difficult conversations with their physician or caregiver in an area that's not as private as we would like it to be. Um, and it can feel sometimes, particularly in the winter time when flu season is, uh, is on and uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of increased admissions to hospital, it can feel sometimes like we need bunk beds uh, in the emergency department. Um, and people can feel like they're stacked on top of one another. And we, as I alluded to, care for a very vulnerable population in our emergency department. Um, a lot of young patients, but also a lot of sick patients with complex medical needs and medical illnesses. Um, and a lot of those are older patients. Um, and you can well imagine that um, for an older patient who may have some cognitive difficulties, um, who may have hearing issues, who may have vision issues, um, who has complicated medical problems and medication administration schedules and things like that, being in a hallway, um, for hours on end, um, without the ability to be isolated from light, from noise, from traffic, without easy access to a washroom, um, and trying to get the attention of a, of a care staff person as they walk by, um, is not a pleasant experience. Um, and so I would challenge anyone to say that the care given in our emergency department with respect to the medical 
treatment, diagnostics, um, and the experience and passion of our staff uh, is second to none. Um, but I also recognize that the experience of receiving that care for many patients is not always optimal. And uh, we don't want our patients to have to be this person um, who's being cared for in a stretcher next to the door with constant traffic going by in the middle of winter. Right? Nobody wants that. And yet, unfortunately, at many times that has had to become the reality of patients' experience in the emergency department. We also care for a lot of people who are near the end of life um, or who are receiving terrible news and whose families are trying to gather around them uh, and who need support, who need privacy, who need to absorb challenging information. Um, and we want to have a department that provides the best possible care and space for those things to happen. Um, but you can imagine it's a challenging, busy, noisy place uh, where uh, receiving your diagnosis of cancer uh, or being told your loved one is not going to survive uh, is not always uh, as private or as calming a place. Um, our team wants all of our patients um, to have an experience of care that is just as good, if not better, than the expertise and skill uh, and quality of the medicine being practiced in the department. Um, because again, I'm uh, uh, very proud of the skills and accomplishments of our team. Um, but I want that to be reflected in how patients feel when they're treated in our emergency department. And so we're continuously working to improve. Um, we listen carefully to feedback from patients and families. Um, we are very engaged as a team in advocating for better resources for emergency care in this community um, uh, and beyond. Uh, we uh, are always looking at how can we do better by the patients who come through our door. Um, and a lot of that attitude of continuous quality improvement um, has been reflected in our uh, numbers looking better. Uh, but we're not satisfied. Um, we want to keep going. We want to get better. Um, we want you to feel like when you show up in the emergency department, it's going to be a good experience. And so that's why we are very excited uh, about the project to come. Um, uh, I was uh, happy to be at the announcement uh, from the Minister of Health uh, recently uh, recommitting uh, to phase two redevelopment at the Kingston General Hospital site, um, which is going to involve uh, tear down of a number of the old uh, structures within the core of the uh, hospital campus and uh, the building of this new uh, several story high tower, the entire ground floor of which is going to be a brand new emergency department for our city. This has been a very long time coming um, and has been the result of tremendous advocacy from this community and its leaders um, and its citizens uh, and the hospitals over many years. Um, and uh, it is so exciting that it's finally happening. Um, I, as I was looking for pictures uh, for this talk, I actually Googled hospital redevelopment in Kingston and found announcements from six different health ministers uh, in the lobby standing in front of uh, a KGH sign. But, uh, but we're, we are on track uh, for this to happen and, and we couldn't be happier. 20 years to make our wish list um, and uh, are continuing uh, to identify what our priorities are as a team what the priorities and needs of our patients are uh, for this new space um, uh, based on our current and expected future needs as a community. And I've had the chance to be very uh, intimately involved so far in some of the preliminary design work. I'm not expecting you to get much out of this slide other than to say um, uh, designing an emergency department is a very complicated process. And this is one of our uh, initial uh, blueprints, uh, which uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Um, 
but uh, work, working collaboratively uh, with stakeholders inside the hospital and outside to design a space that is going to be cutting edge and state of the art um, and uh, provide this city with uh, a facility that it's been lacking for a long time. And, and this is exciting. We want the new emergency department to give us the capacity first and foremost to provide better care for our patients and to make them feel as though they are receiving better care. So our new department is going to have more than 50 stretcher areas but in addition to that we're going to have uh, a number of uh, expanded trauma and resuscitation rooms, um, some enhanced space to deliver critical care uh, to our sickest patients. We're going to create uh, a secure uh, and more private acute mental health assessment zone uh, that we can work collaboratively with uh, our friends from psychiatry uh, to, to staff and create a care model that means that patients in mental health crisis are not having to wait in the waiting room for a long time, are not having to be um, mixed in um, with uh, the rest of the medical population because often that interaction is challenging for both sides and can, uh, can contribute to a poor experience for both sets of patients. We're looking at specialized care spaces um, for our youngest patients um, but also trying to recognize the needs of some of our bariatric or very obese patients in the city um, who often have significant uh, issues with accessibility. Um, when it comes to care in the emergency department. So having the facilities and the equipment necessary to care for the specialized patient populations like that is going to be a key part of our new build. Uh, Bob Nolan uh, and I were speaking before lunch about uh, how excited we are about being able to expand uh, the capacity for imaging services um, in uh, the new emergency department with an in-emergency department CAT scanner. Um, as well as other x-ray facilities. Um, and additionally, we're going to have more of these zones for fast-tracked care, more chair areas um, that allow people who don't need to be vertical to stay horizontal uh, while receiving assessment and care, um, really optimally using the space. And we also want to include improved family areas um, that will allow patients to have their support teams with them uh, at their time of medical illness and crisis. We want rooms with more privacy. We're going to be going from having uh, 40 rooms separated by paper curtains to rooms with walls and doors um, that allow patients to be uh, more private, uh, that will reduce noise and light exposure, um, that will promote better infection control practices so that coming to the hospital doesn't make you sick. Uh, better washroom facilities, um, which sounds like a no-brainer and yet is one of the biggest challenges faced by many of our patients who have limited mobility um, uh, or other special care needs. And ultimately, we want this to be a space that has better accessibility for all of the people who are coming through. And the goal of all of this is not just more space for more space's sake, but it's more space that allows us to use space better and smarter, uh, that allows us to implement better practices for patient flow uh, and for better care. And ultimately, it's about enhancing the patient experience when you come to the emergency department. Uh, we have world-class skills that I'm incredibly proud of. We have immense passion as a team to provide outstanding emergency care uh, and to look after you and others in this community uh, as well as we would want to look after any of our own loved ones. Um, we have the team to make this happen and we're enthusiastically waiting uh, uh, to have a space that allows this to be enhanced. Um, and that will happen um, with the support of the hospital, um, with the support of the team, uh, and with the support of the community, uh, which is why I want to close by just saying thank you to all of you for coming and listening and for your support. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions, uh, but most of all, thanks for the opportunity to come and speak to you today.
Thank you so much, Dr. Messenger. I know that our regulars who attend will realize we took a slightly different format. Usually we have two or three speakers, but we did feel it was important for you to get a sense of the um, burgeoning demand that our very talented emergency team is faced with trying to ensure um, receives excellent care no matter what the circumstances of their arrival at the hospital doors. I think you probably have the same sense that I do of how resourceful and committed and uh, bright and um, focused these people are on trying to make this a better experience for all of us, recognizing that when we arrive at the emergency room doors, we may have all kinds of feelings of uncertainty and anxiety, uh, not knowing what's going on, and, and the sheer commitment and talent and compassion of these folks is a real um, benefit and blessing to the patients who do find themselves in that circumstance. There's only so far resourcefulness can take us and, and um, investment in infrastructure is absolutely going to be essential for us to take the next step to provide the quality of care that the team is fully capable of um, in an environment that supports the care experience that they all want to deliver. Um, I did just want to mention briefly, I think you had a sense from the very early slide that patient flow through the hospital is one of the issues that affects people's access to emergency services and certainly the availability of 10 more beds in the unit is going to help. But there's an outflow piece on the other end of the care spectrum that has a effect right through back to the emergency department and actually to access to surgical care as well. Because when the patients are not able to be discharged into the kind of care they need, it has an effect of blocking the flow of patients through the system. So I just wanted to make sure that all of you had heard the announcement that was made, I guess we're still in May, so earlier this month. Um, one of the places that patients who are in need of an alternative level of care, and there are typically between 40 and 70 or 80 of those in the Kingston Health Sciences side. Um, as of yesterday, there were 55 at the Providence Care Hospital. So over 100 people who needed other kinds of care. And although there are many places that provide alternative level of care, um, one of the most significant is our long-term care homes. So earlier this month, we had an announcement that Providence Care has been given 77 additional bed licenses, uh, contingent on them building a 320 bed home that opens by 2022. There is a component of that project that Providence Care has asked the foundation to fund. Um, the ministry has a capital funding mechanism that will allow for the construction of a very basic, very safe and very effective facility, but nonetheless basic. Any of you who've had family members who've been cared for in the manor will know that there are many elements of that facility that are beyond basic. Uh, I think we're one of the few nursing homes in the province that has a pub, for example. Um, there are some quite nice and important gathering spaces, the garden, the area that reflects our um, heritage with veterans, uh, the chapel space, um, many of the other gathering areas. And so uh, the people who are the leaders of Providence Care have a real vision to recreate that same feeling in the new home. In order to do that, they've asked the foundation to find $15 million to contribute. And we've had $10 million committed so far. And with this deadline of 2022, we are going to be focusing the community on trying to make sure that those 77 beds come to this community and are uh, provided in the under the auspices of Providence Care, who do an exceptionally good job of providing very high quality long-term care. I know we all hope we won't need it, <laughs> um, but the fact is some of us will at some point. So I did want to make you aware of that fantastic announcement, 77 more beds, as long as we can find the portion that needs to help pay for the building. And again, I wanted to thank you very much for your support. Um, we are greatly encouraged to see so many people in the room today who send their checks, large and small, and who are so thoughtful in thinking about how their generosity can make for a better quality of life for everyone who lives here. We've got lots of exciting projects on the go over the next number of years. It'll be exciting to see shovel in ground on that uh, big tower going in at KGH. Um, we are uh, working closely with the planning office and they are moving forward on design elements for the new facilities and when they're firm, uh, which I think will probably happen after they've selected somebody to do the final design work, then we'll make sure that we share those with you.